Andromedan blood dripped from the edges of human blades, spattering on the decks of their once proud warships. The arrogant galactic empire brought to its knees, begging for mercy that would not come. They made their choice when they butchered human colonists. Now they would pay the price. Admiral Daniel Scorer stood on the bridge of the UES Atlas, knuckles white as he gripped the rail. An emergency distress call blared through the CIC speakers. New Jakarta colony was under heavy assault by Andromedan forces, civilian targets shattered and in flames. Innocent blood pooling on the streets as the alien invaders slaughtered indiscriminately. Scorer's jaw clenched. The Fifth Fleet had to respond immediately or the colonists were doomed. He barked jump coordinates to the navigator. The battle group lurched into hyperspace, racing toward the burning colony. Minutes later they emerged to a scene of utter devastation. New Jakarta's orbital defences lay in ruins as Andromedan warships pounded the planet from above. Fires raged across continents. Scorer took in the chaos, eyes hardening to chips of flint. Those motherfuckers would pay for what they'd done. All ships, combat alert, Scorer called into the fleet channel. Prepare to engage the enemy. They were outmatched by the Andromedan battle group. Two heavy cruisers and a dozen escorts against the Atlas and her small screen. Long odds for the humans. But what choice did they have? Thousands more would die every second they delayed. The colony would fall unless Scorer acted now, while praying reinforcements reached them in time. He had to hold the line. No matter the cost, they could not let the Andromedans have New Jakarta. Humanity's fate would be decided here, in the fires of this burning world. Scorer gripped the rail tighter, the burden of command weighing heavily, as he prepared to give the order to advance. On the Andromedan flagship Eye of Thalassar, Commodore Zephyr watched the humans with a dismissive sneer. So the upstart Terrans wanted to challenge the might of the Andromedan Empire. They would be crushed like insects beneath his heel, and he would savour every moment of watching them burn. The UES Atlas shuddered as Andromedan plasma fire slammed into her shields. Scorer braced himself against the tremors, shouting to be heard over the chaos. Helm, bring us about. Engineering, divert power to forward batteries. It's time to take the fight to these alien bastards. The human ships moved as one, the Atlas charging ahead like a raging bull while her escorts fanned out in a pincer formation. The Andromedans, caught off guard by the ferocity of the assault, scrambled to reposition, but Scorer had them right where he wanted them. All ships, focus fire on the nearest cruiser, Scorer bellowed. The Atlas's particle beams lanced out, searing into the enemy ship's hull. The Valiant and her sister destroyers joined the barrage, missiles and railgun rounds hammering the cruiser's weakening shields. On the Andromedan bridge, a grim-faced Zephyr watched his cruiser buckle under the onslaught. Redirect power to forward shields. Return fire. All batteries. Around him, officers rushed to obey as smoke poured from overloaded consoles. Seizing the moment, Scorer opened the fighter channel. Paxton, you're clear to commence attack runs. Give them hell, Ace. With pleasure, Admiral, Paxton replied, his grin audible. The Atlas's fighters streaked towards the beleaguered Andromedans, juking and weaving through the hail of point defense fire. Paxton lined up on the cruiser's engine block and thumbed the trigger. A volley of plasma torpedoes shot forth, slamming into the ship's rear and engulfing it in blossoms of flame. The cruiser listed to port, venting atmosphere and debris. Secondary explosions rippled across its hull as the Atlas and Valiant poured on the fire. With a final shuddering groan, the Andromedan warship split apart, its reactor going critical in a blinding flash. Zephyr pounded a fist on the arm of his command chair, teeth bared in a snarl. All ships, target the human flagship. Tear that accursed ship apart. The remaining Andromedans regrouped, pouring a storm of plasma into the Atlas's shields. Scorer held tight as the bridge quaked around him, damage reports flooding in. They couldn't take much more of this. It was time for one last desperate gambit. Helm plot a collision course with the remaining cruiser. Divert all power to engines and forward shields. Scorer's voice was steel. We're going to ram the bastards. The Atlas surged forward, 
alarms blaring as the enemy fire intensified. Consoles burst in showers of sparks, the lights flickering, but still the battleship drove on, closing the distance to the Andromedan cruiser. Zephyr watched in disbelief as the Atlas, trailing fire and debris smashed into his ship like a battering ram. The cruiser's hull crumpled inward, the Atlas's prow crashing through decks and bulkheads. A moment later, the human ship's reactors detonated, vaporizing both vessels in a cataclysmic blast. As the light faded, Paxton led the remaining fighters after the fleeing Andromedan escorts. One by one, they fell to the humans' vengeful guns until only the Eye of Thalassar was left, alone and outmatched. Commodore Zephyr gripped the arms of his command chair, the stench of smoke and death filling the bridge of the Eye of Thalassar. Flickering displays painted his face in shades of crimson, highlighting the desperation in his eyes. The battle was lost. The humans had outmaneuvered him at every turn, their ships tearing through his fleet like wolves among sheep. Helmsman, plot an emergency jump to hyperspace, Zephyr ordered, his voice strained. We must retreat before... The ship lurched violently, throwing the Commodore from his seat. He crashed to the deck, pain lancing through his shoulder. Alarms blared, the sound drilling into his skull. Report, Zephyr shouted, hauling himself upright. Our engines are gone, sir, the helmsman replied, fear etched into his features. We're dead in space. A Zephyr paled as the tactical display showed the human ship surrounding his crippled vessel, their weapons trained on the eye of Thalassa's hull. Incoming transmissions flooded the comm system, the Terran's demands for surrender echoing through the bridge. Aboard the UES Valiant, Commander Xavier Kincaid watched the Andromedan flagship with a predator's gaze. Admiral Scorer's protégé and right hand, Kincaid knew the significance of this moment. Never before had an Andromedan commander been captured. Lieutenant, assemble a boarding party, Kincaid ordered, his voice cold as the void. I want Marines on that ship immediately. Secure the vessel and take the Commodore alive if possible. Aye, sir, the lieutenant replied, already relaying the orders. On the eye of Thalassar's bridge, Consoles flickered and died as the ship's systems failed one by one. Zephyr slumped in his command chair, the weight of his defeat crushing his shoulders. The arrogance that had driven him to attack the human colony was gone, replaced by the bitter taste of despair. The bridge doors exploded inward, the sound like a thunderclap in the confined space. Heavily armed human marines poured through the breach, their weapons trained on the Andromedan crew. The aliens offered no resistance as the marines secured the bridge, roughly binding their hands behind their backs. Sergeant Hawkins, a grizzled veteran with cold eyes and a scar bisecting his chin, strode up to Zephyr. He pressed the barrel of his rifle against the Commodore's forehead, the metal still hot from the fighting. Surrender now, Hawkins growled, his finger hovering over the trigger, or I'll splatter your brains across this pretty bridge myself. Zephyr looked up at the human, seeing his own reflection in the Marine's mirrored visor. The face that stared back at him was broken, devoid of hope. Slowly he raised his hands in submission, the fight draining from his body. But even as he surrendered, Zephyr's eyes burned with hatred for the humans who had so thoroughly humiliated him. They had shattered his fleet, crushed his ambitions, and now they would parade him before the galaxy as a trophy of their victory. The Commodore's thoughts turned to the Emperor, to the disgrace he would bring upon the Andromedan throne. Death would be preferable to the shame that awaited him, but as the Marines hauled him to his feet, binding his wrists with cold metal, Zephyr knew that even that escape would be denied to him. He was now a prisoner of war, his fate resting in the hands of the humans he had so foolishly underestimated, and as the Marines marched him through the ruined corridors of his once proud flagship, Zephyr could only wonder what new horrors the Terrans had in store for him. The news of Commodore Zephyr's capture hit the Andromedan Empire like a meteor strike. Nothing like this had ever happened before. The humans, once considered a minor nuisance, had dealt a devastating blow to Andromedan pride. Emperor Xerxes the Tet paced his throne room on Thalassar Prime, his face twisted with rage as terrified advisers delivered the grim report.
Those damn Terrans dare lay hands on an Andromedan Commodore, Xerxes snarled, slamming a fist on the arm of his throne. The advisers flinched, keeping their eyes downcast. I want the full might of our fleets mobilized immediately. Every ship, every soldier, every weapon at our disposal. We will drown the humans in their own blood and remind the galaxy why the Andromedans are to be feared. As the Emperor's orders spread, Andromedan warships and troop transports poured from shipyards and staging areas across the Empire. The full industrial might of a galactic power bent towards a single purpose, the complete subjugation of humanity. In the weeks that followed, the Andromedans launched attack after brutal attack on human colonies and outposts, seeking to overwhelm the Terrans through sheer numbers and firepower. But the humans refused to buckle under the onslaught. Newly promoted Fleet Admiral Daniel Scorer rallied Earth's defenders, his tactical acumen and the sheer tenacity of human forces blunting the Andromedan offensives at every turn. On the embattled colony of Novaya Moskva, Colonel Viktor Sokolov and the 112th Infantry Regiment fought a desperate battle against a massive Andromedan invasion force. The ground shook as dropships disgorged thousands of Andromedan shock troopers and armoured vehicles onto the planet's surface. Sokolov watched grimly from the ramparts of the capital city's defences as the enemy formed up and began their advance. He turned to his soldiers, men and women covered in grime and blood, exhaustion etched on their faces, but in their eyes he saw a steely determination that mirrored his own. The Andromedans think they can march in here and take what's ours, Sokolov growled, his voice carrying to every ear. They think we'll break and run like frightened children, but they're wrong. We're the 112th, and we hold the line, no matter the cost, no matter the odds. This is our home, and we'll die before we let these bastards have it. A ragged cheer went up from the human defenders, as Sokolov's words galvanized their resolve. They manned their weapons and fortifications, ready to meet the Andromedan assault. And when it came, they fought with a ferocity that staggered their foes. Every street became a battle zone, every building a fortress to be defended, to the last bullet and breath. Far above Novaya Moskva, in the cold void of the Epsilon Eridani system, another desperate struggle played out. An Andromedan dreadnought, a behemoth bristling with enough firepower to reduce a planet to molten slag, bore down on a ragtag fleet of human refugee ships fleeing the invasion. The massive warship swept aside the refugees' paltry defences, its weapons charging for a final murderous salvo. But Captain Li Shang of the UES Shenzhou had other plans. With a calm born of absolute resolve, he ordered his cruiser to accelerate on a collision course with the enemy Dreadnought. Ignoring the pleas of his crew, Shang held fast as the Shenzhou hurtled towards the Andromedan vessel. At the last moment, he gave the order to abandon ship, remaining on the bridge as escape pods blossomed from the Shenzhou's hull. The cruiser, all guns blazing in final defiance, rammed the dreadnought amidships with the force of an exploding sun. Both vessels vanished in a blinding flash of light, a funeral pyre for a hero of humanity. But Shang's sacrifice was not in vain. The refugees made it to safety, living to fight another day. These acts of courage and defiance, repeated on a hundred worlds and a thousand battlefields, became rallying cries for the beleaguered human forces. Even as the Andromedans redoubled their efforts to conquer and destroy, the Terrans stood firm, determined to fight to the last. The war was far from over, but one thing was certain. Humanity would not go quietly into the night. Fleet Admiral Scorer pored over the latest intelligence reports. His brow furrowed in concentration. The interrogation of Commodore Zephyr had yielded a crucial piece of information, the location of a major Andromedan supply base in the Gamma Serpentis system. The base was a linchpin in the enemy's war machine, providing the fuel, munitions and repairs that kept their fleets operational. If the humans could take it out, they would strike a devastating blow to the Andromedans' ability to sustain their offensive. Scorer summoned his most trusted officers to the briefing room. Captain Marcus Blaise Brennan, the leader of an elite Marine Raider platoon, stood at attention alongside Commander Olivia Siren Hawk, the skipper of the UES Odyssey, a cutting-edge stealth frigate fresh from the shipyards. I'll cut to the chase, Scorer said, his voice grave. 
We have a chance to hit the Andromedans where it hurts, a chance to turn the tide of this war, but it won't be easy. He brought up a holographic display of the supply base, highlighting its defenses. Captain Brennan, your mission is to infiltrate the base, plant a series of tactical nukes, and get the hell out before we light the place up like a supernova. Brennan nodded, his eyes gleaming with determination. We'll get it done, Admiral. The Andromedans won't know what hit them. Commander Hawk, Scorer continued, your job is to get the Marines in undetected and provide extraction once the fireworks start. The Odyssey's stealth capabilities will be put to the test. We won't let you down, sir, Hawk replied, her voice cool and confident. As the Odyssey slipped through the void towards Gamma Serpentis, its advanced cloaking systems rendering it all but invisible, Captain Brennan and his Marines made their final preparations. They checked and rechecked their weapons, memorized the layout of the base and steeled themselves for the challenge ahead. They knew the risks. If they were discovered, they would be facing impossible odds. But they also knew that the fate of humanity hung in the balance. To listen up, Raiders, Brennan said, his voice cutting through the tension in the drop bay. I won't lie to you, this is going to be the toughest mission of our lives, but I know each and every one of you has the guts and the skills to see it through. We're the best of the best, and we're going to show these Andromedan bastards what happens when you mess with the human race. The Marines responded with a resounding hua, their determination palpable. Has the Odyssey entered orbit around the planet housing the supply base, the Marines loaded into their drop pods, their active camouflage systems blending them seamlessly with the surrounding environment. With a series of muffled thumps, the pods launched, hurtling towards the surface like invisible meteors. The raiders hit the ground running, their boots barely touching the dirt before they were on the move. They ghosted through the base's perimeter defences, their camouflage rendering them little more than shimmers in the darkness. With practiced efficiency, they split into teams, each one tasked with planting nukes at a critical location. Sergeant Hideki Tanaka led his team towards the base's main reactor, moving like wraiths through the shadowy corridors. They encountered a pair of Andromedan sentries, but before the aliens could raise the alarm, Tanaka and his marines dispatched them with silenced bursts from their pulse rifles. As they reached the reactor room, Tanaka and his demolitions expert, Corporal Mira Sokolova, set to work planting the nuke. Their hands moved with precision, arming the device and setting the timer. Just as they were about to make their escape, the base's alarms began to wail. Shit, Tanaka cursed, his voice tight with tension. We've been made, all teams, status report. The other teams checked in, confirming that they had planted their nukes and were exfiltrating. But as Tanaka and his marines raced towards the extraction point, they found their path blocked by a phalanx of Andromedan troops. Captain Brennan's voice crackled over the comm. Tanaka, we're cut off. I'm splitting the platoon. You complete the mission. We'll buy you some time. Tanaka gritted his teeth, knowing the sacrifice Brennan was making. Understood, sir. Give him hell. As Tanaka and his team fought their way to the extraction zone, Captain Brennan and the remaining Marines dug in preparing to hold off the Andromedan onslaught. They took up defensive positions, using the base's own structures for cover. The Andromedans came at them in waves, their energy weapons stitching the air with searing bolts of plasma. But the Marines held fast, their own weapons spitting death in return. Brennan was a blur of motion, his pulse rifle barking as he cut down alien after alien. Private Liam O'Connell, the platoon's youngest member, fell to a plasma bolt, his chest a smoking ruin. Sergeant Anaya Patel dragged him to cover, but it was too late. Brennan felt the loss like a knife to the gut, but he pushed the pain aside, focusing on the battle. Just as the Marine's position was about to be overrun, a series of thunderous detonations rocked the base. The Odyssey, having received Tanaka's signal, had decloaked and opened fire, its railguns and laser batteries ripping through the Andromedan ranks like a scythe through wheat. All units, this is Commander Hawk, the Odyssey skipper announced over the comm. Get to the extraction point now, we're out of time. Brennan and his surviving marines fought their way to the waiting dropship, the Odyssey's guns providing covering fire. 
they piled into the craft, their faces grim and exhausted. As the dropship rocketed back towards the Odyssey, the Marines watched through the viewports as the supply base erupted in a blinding flash of nuclear fire, the tactical nukes reducing it to atoms. The dropship docked with the Odyssey, and the frigate jumped to hyperspace just as the shock wave from the exploding base reached them. In the aftermath of the mission, the Marines tended to their wounds and mourned their fallen comrades. They had struck a mighty blow against the Andromedans, but the cost had been high. Fleet Admiral Scorer received the news of the mission's success with a mix of elation and somber respect for the sacrifices made. The destruction of the supply base would severely hamper the Andromedan war effort, giving the human forces a much-needed reprieve. But he knew the war was far from over. The Andromedans would surely seek retribution for this brazen attack, and the humans would need to be ready. As the Odyssey sailed through the void, carrying its weary but victorious crew, Captain Brennan looked out at the stars, his thoughts on the battles yet to come. The road ahead would be long and bloody, but he and his marines would be ready. For Earth, for humanity. They would fight to the bitter end. The news of the Gamma Serpentis supply base's annihilation hit the Andromedan Empire like a seismic shock. With a single stroke, the humans had crippled their enemy's ability to wage war. Andromedan fleets, once an unstoppable juggernaut, now found themselves scraping the bottom of their supply barrels. Ships sat idle in docks, waiting for fuel and parts that might never come. Soldiers on the front lines rationed their ammo, knowing each shot had to count. In the opulent halls of the Imperial Palace on Thalassar Prime, Emperor Xerxes raged. His advisers scattered like leaves in a hurricane, desperate to avoid his wrath. He paced the throne room, his face twisted in a mask of fury. Incompetence, fools, Xerxes bellowed. How could we let the humans strike such a blow? Where were our defences, our countermeasures? The advisers quailed, offering no answers. They knew that to speak now was to invite the Emperor's ire upon their own heads. Xerxes stopped his pacing. His eyes gleamed with a sudden, terrifying intensity. Summon Grand Admiral Zolthar immediately. A ripple of fear passed through the assembled courtiers. Zolthar was a name spoken in hushed whispers, a legend even among the Andromedans. He had been away for years, leading campaigns in the far reaches of the Empire. Some said he had grown as cold and merciless as the Void itself. But if anyone could turn the tide against the humans, it was Zolthar. The Grand Admiral arrived within a day, his flagship Imperator dropping out of hyperspace in a blaze of light. He strode into the Imperial Palace like a conquering hero, his black uniform immaculate, his medals gleaming on his chest. Zolthar bowed before the Emperor, a gesture that seemed almost mocking in its precision. Your Majesty, how may I serve the Empire? Xerxes leaned forward on his throne. You will crush the humans, Zolthar. You will make them pay for their insolence. A thin smile cut across Zolthar's face. Of course, Your Majesty, I have a plan. A trap that will lure the human fleet to its doom. In the war room of the Imperator, Zolthar outlined his strategy. At its heart was the Andromedan colony of Athena Prime. We will withdraw our forces from Athena Prime, Zolthar explained, leaving it seemingly vulnerable. The humans, flush with their victory at Gamma Serpentis, will not be able to resist such a tempting target. His officers exchanged glances. To leave a colony undefended was unthinkable, but Zolthar's reputation brooked no argument. When the humans attack, we will be waiting for them. The full might of our fleet hidden in the system's asteroid belt, we will surround them, outgun them, and crush them. Zolthar's eyes glinted. And then, we will show the galaxy what happens to those who defy the Andromedan Empire. News of Athena Prime's vulnerability did not take long to reach human ears. In his headquarters on Earth, Fleet Admiral Scorer pored over the intelligence reports, hardly daring to believe what he was reading. It has to be a trap, said Commander Kincaid, shaking his head. The Andromedans wouldn't just leave a colony unguarded. Scorer stroked his chin deep in thought. Perhaps, but we can't afford to pass up this opportunity. If we can take Athena Prime, 
it would be another devastating blow to the Empire. He stood, his jaw set with determination. Assemble the fleet, we're going to hit the Andromedans with everything we've got. The pride of the human fleet gathered in Earth orbit, ready for the jump to Athena Prime. At its head was the UES Titan, a behemoth of a ship bristling with enough firepower to level a continent. On the Titan's bridge, Admiral Scorer settled into his command chair. The tension was palpable as the crew made final preparations for the jump. All ships, this is Admiral Scorer. Our objective is simple. Take Athena Prime and deal another crushing blow to the Andromedans. We don't know what we'll find when we arrive, but I have faith in each and every one of you. For Earth, for humanity, let's bring the fight to the enemy. Scorer out. A cheer went up from the crew as the fleet aligned for the jump. There was a moment of breathless anticipation. Then the stars stretched and blurred as the ships leaped into hyperspace. They emerged in the Athena system, weapons charged and shields raised ready for anything. But what they found waiting for them was beyond their worst nightmares. Andromedan ships, hundreds of them, surrounded the human fleet on all sides. Dreadnoughts, cruisers, frigates, fighters. It seemed as if the entire Andromedan armada had gathered here, waiting for this moment. And at their head aboard the Imperator was Grand Admiral Zolthar himself. All ships open fire, Zolthar commanded his voice cold. Let none survive. The Andromedan fleet unleashed a storm of plasma and laser fire, tearing into the human ships with merciless precision. The UES Titan shuddered as its shields absorbed the brunt of the onslaught, but even it could not withstand such concentrated firepower for long. On the Titan's bridge, alarms blared and consoles sparked. Admiral Scorer gripped the arms of his chair as the ship bucked and heaved. Evasive maneuvers, he shouted over the din. Get us out of their crossfire. But it was too late. The human fleet was trapped, caught in a web of Andromedan ships with no escape. One by one, human ships succumbed to the enemy's guns, exploding in brilliant fireballs that lit up the void. In a last desperate gambit, Scora ordered the Titan to spearhead a breakout attempt. If they could punch a hole in the Andromedan lines, perhaps some of the fleet might escape to fight another day. The Titan surged forward, its immense guns blazing, pouring fire into the Andromedan ships with every ounce of power it had, but it was met by a wall of dreadnoughts, their combined firepower enough to reduce a planet to molten slag. The Titan's shields flickered and died under the onslaught. Its hull buckled and cracked, venting atmosphere and debris into the void. On the bridge, consoles exploded in showers of sparks and flame. Admiral Scora hauled himself up from the deck, blood trickling from a cut on his forehead. Around him, his bridge crew lay dead or dying, the once proud command center reduced to a smoldering ruin. He stared out of the cracked viewports at the carnage unfolding around him. Human ships, once symbols of Earth's might and determination, now little more than shattered husks drifting in the void. And beyond them, the Andromedan fleet, victorious and unscathed, a grim testament to the trap that had been sprung. Scorer slumped back in his chair, the weight of the defeat pressing down on him like a physical force. He had played right into Zolthar's hands, leading his fleet, his people, into a slaughter. As the last of the Titan systems failed, and the lights flickered out, Scorer could only wonder how humanity would survive this darkest of hours. The bridge of the Titan shook violently, sparks flying from overloaded consoles as the ship fought to stay intact under the relentless Andromedan onslaught. Admiral Scorer gripped the arms of his command chair, his knuckles white as he watched his fleet being torn apart. The view screen showed a grim tableau of destruction, human ships reduced to shattered hulks, their crews consigned to the cold embrace of the void. Shields down to 15 percent, the tactical officer shouted over the cacophony of alarms, Hull breaches on deck 7 through 12. Skora gritted his teeth. They had played right into Zolthar's hands and now they were paying the price. The Titan, for all its might, was no match for the combined firepower of the Andromedan Armada. It was only a matter of time before they were overwhelmed. Suddenly, a blinding flash of light erupted on the view screens, causing the bridge crew to shield their eyes. As the glare faded, 
a new contact appeared on the sensors, a massive ship of unknown design that dwarfed even the Titan in size. What the hell is that? Scora demanded, leaning forward in his chair. The comms officer, her face pale, turned to the Admiral. Sir, we're receiving a transmission. It's... it's not from the Andromedans. Put it through. The view screens flickered, and a figure appeared, a being of such otherworldly beauty and grace that it took Scora's breath away. Its skin was a shimmering silver, its eyes glowing with an inner light that seemed to pierce the very soul. People of Earth, Andromedans, the being spoke, its voice resonating with power and authority. We are the Zeniths. For too long we have watched as you wage your petty wars, squandering your potential in a cycle of destruction. No more. We will not stand idly by as you tear each other apart. On the Andromedan ships, a similar scene played out, the crews staring in awe and terror at the Zenith Herald. Even Grand Admiral Zolthar, the great strategist, was at a loss. His trap suddenly turned against him. The Zenith's message continued, echoing across the battlefield. You have a choice. Lay down your arms and join us in a new era of peace and enlightenment, or face the consequences of your foolish aggression. As if to punctuate the Zenith's words, the Celestial Ascendant opened fire, a barrage of exotic energy weapons lancing out towards the Andromedan fleet. The beams cut through the enemy ships like a scythe through wheat, shields flaring and failing, hulls shattering under the onslaught. Zolthar, his face ashen, barked orders to his crew. All ships, retreat! Emergency jump to hyperspace! But it was too late. The Zeniths pursued the fleeing Andromedans, their ships moving with impossible speed and grace, outmaneuvering the enemy at every turn. One by one, the Andromedan vessels fell, reduced to smoldering wrecks by the Zenith's superior technology. On the Titan's bridge, Scora watched in stunned disbelief as the tide of battle turned. The Zeniths had saved them, snatching victory from the jaws of defeat. But even as relief washed over him, a new sense of unease took hold. The Zeniths had revealed themselves, and in doing so had changed the face of the galaxy forever. What did their presence mean for humanity, for the Andromedans, for the balance of power that had defined the cosmos for so long? As the last of the Andromedan ships vanished into the depths of space, the Celestial Ascendant turned its attention to the battered human fleet. Scora straightened in his chair, steeling himself for whatever came next. The future was uncertain, but one thing was clear. Nothing would ever be the same again. The Celestial Ascendant disappeared back into the void as quickly as it had arrived. The stunned silence that followed was broken only by the hiss of static over the comms and the distant creaking of shattered hulls. On the bridge of the Titan, Admiral Scorer stared at the view screens, hardly daring to believe what he had just witnessed. The Zeniths, the mythical race spoken of only in whispers, had intervened at the moment of humanity's greatest peril. And just as suddenly, they were gone, leaving behind a single cryptic message. Oh, we will be watching. The words echoed in Scorer's mind as he surveyed the aftermath of the battle. The once proud Andromedan fleet was in ruins, their ships reduced to drifting wrecks and clouds of debris. The mighty Imperator, Grand Admiral Zolthar's flagship, was nowhere to be seen having fled the field in the face of the Zenith's onslaught. It was a victory beyond anything Skora could have imagined. But even as relief washed over him, he knew that the true challenge was just beginning. The comms officer's voice snapped him out of his thoughts. Admiral, we're receiving a transmission from Thalassa Prime. It's... it's Emperor Xerxes himself. Scora straightened in his chair, his jaw set. Put him through. The view screen flickered, and the image of the Andromedan Emperor appeared. Gone was the arrogance, the sneering superiority that had defined their previous interactions. Xerxes looked haggard, his eyes haunted by the scale of the defeat he had just witnessed. Fleet Admiral Scorer, he said, his voice heavy with resignation, I, I am prepared to discuss terms of surrender. Scorer leaned forward, his gaze intense. Emperor Xerxes, the human race has suffered greatly at the hands of your empire. 
we have lost countless lives, seen our worlds burned and our people enslaved. He paused, letting the weight of his words sink in. We demand nothing less than the complete demilitarization of the Andromedan Empire, the immediate withdrawal from all occupied human territories, and the extradition of your war criminals to face justice. Xerxes closed his eyes, the picture of a broken man. I, I have no choice but to accept your terms, Admiral. The Andromedan Empire, my empire, lies in ruins. I will sign the Instrument of Surrender. The formal ceremony was broadcast across the galaxy, a signal to all that the war had ended. In the Great Hall of the Galactic Council, Emperor Xerxes signed the document that would forever change the balance of power. His hand shook as he lifted the pen, the weight of his defeat pressing down on him like a physical force. As he signed, he couldn't help but reflect on the bitter irony of it all. The Andromedans, who had once looked upon the humans as primitive upstarts, were now utterly at their mercy. In the days that followed, the human fleets moved to secure the former Andromedan territories. Scora, hailed as a hero by the cheering masses, found himself at the centre of a new galactic order. The respect and admiration of a hundred races was laid at humanity's feet, their victory over the Andromedans a shining beacon in the darkness of space. But even as he stood before the adoring crowds, Scora's thoughts were haunted by the spectre of the Zeniths. Their power was beyond anything he had ever imagined, their motives inscrutable. What did their intervention mean for the future of humanity, for the fragile peace they had won at such great cost? As he looked out over the sea of faces, Scora knew one thing for certain. The galaxy had changed forever, and humanity's place in it would never be the same. The war was over, but the work had just begun. In the aftermath of the Andromedan Empire's defeat, humanity found itself in a position of unprecedented influence. No longer the upstart newcomers, they were now the dominant power in the galaxy, looked to by other races for leadership and guidance. It was a role that Grand Admiral Scorer, the hero of the war, took on with a grim sense of responsibility. He stood on the observation deck of the newly constructed Galactic Council headquarters, looking out over the gleaming spires of the city below. Representatives from a hundred different species moved through the halls, a testament to the new era of cooperation and diplomacy that humanity was ushering in. But even as Skora worked to forge new alliances and treaties, he knew that not everyone was happy with the new order. There were those who had benefited from the Andromedan Empire's rule, who resented humanity's victory and the changes it had brought. Whispers reached his ears of dissent and rebellion brewing in the shadows. A chime at the door interrupted his thoughts. Enter! he called out. Commander Kincaid, his trusted aide and protégé, stepped into the room. The younger man had a grim expression on his face. Sir, we have a problem. Skora turned to face him. What is it, Xavier? Our intelligence network has uncovered something disturbing. Kincaid handed over a data pad. A group of Andromedan loyalists, led by none other than Grand Admiral Zolthar himself, has been gathering in the Outer Rim. They've been experimenting with forbidden technologies, things that were banned after the war. Genetic engineering, AI, you name it. Skora's jaw tightened as he read the report. The implications were clear. Zolthar was building an army, one that could potentially rival even humanity's military might. If he wasn't stopped, the galaxy could be plunged into war once again. Damn it, Skora muttered. I thought we'd seen the last of that bastard. What are your orders, sir? Skora looked up, his eyes hard. Assemble a task force, the best of the best from every race. We need to strike fast and hard before Zolthar can complete his plans. Kincaid nodded. I'll get right on it, sir. As his aide left to carry out his orders, Skora turned back to the window. The weight of his responsibilities settled on his shoulders like a physical burden. He had fought so hard, sacrificed so much, to bring peace to the galaxy. He would be damned if he let Zoltar and his fanatics destroy everything they had built. Over the next weeks and months, Skora's task force carried out a series of daring raids against Zoltar's bases and facilities. They struck without warning, 
appearing out of nowhere to sabotage the Andromedan loyalists' operations and neutralize their leaders. But Zolthar himself proved elusive. Always one step ahead, he managed to slip through their grasp, time and again. Skora knew that they were running out of time. With each passing day, Zolthar's army grew stronger, his abominable creations more numerous. Finally, they caught a break. A high-ranking defector from Zolthar's inner circle, a scientist sickened by the depths to which his leader had sunk, came forward with vital information. Zolthar's main base, the heart of his operation, had been located. Skora knew that this was their chance. They had to strike now with everything they had, or risk losing the advantage for good. He gathered his forces, a coalition of the willing from a dozen different races, and set out to confront his old nemesis, once and for all. The battle was joined on a desolate world in the far reaches of the Outer Rim. Zolthar's abominations, twisted mockeries of life created through forbidden science, swarmed over the planet's surface. Skora's forces met them head-on, determination and courage their greatest weapons. In the chaos of the fighting, Skora found himself face to face with Zolthar himself. The Andromedan Admiral was a shell of his former self, his once proud features twisted by hatred and madness. In his eyes, Skora saw the depths of his delusion, his conviction that the Andromedans were the rightful rulers of the galaxy. The two old foes clashed in a titanic struggle, a battle not just of weapons but of wills. They traded blows, each seeking to overcome the other through sheer force and skill. Around them, the battle raged, the fate of the galaxy hanging in the balance. In the end, it was Skora who emerged victorious. With a final desperate strike, he brought Zolthar down, ending the threat of the Andromedan loyalists once and for all. But the victory came at a great cost. Skora himself had been mortally wounded in the fighting, his life's blood seeping out onto the ground. As he lay there, surrounded by his comrades, Skora felt a strange sense of peace. He had given his life in the service of a greater cause, had fought to his last breath to preserve the hard-won peace of the galaxy. With his dying words, he passed the torch to those who would come after, charging them with the duty of carrying on his work. And so the story ended, not with a triumphant fanfare, but with a quiet, bittersweet note. The galaxy had been saved, but at a great cost. The scars of the war would linger for generations, shaping the course of history for years to come. But there was hope, too. Hope that with courage and unity, the peoples of the galaxy could build a brighter future, one of lasting peace and prosperity for all. The galaxy was in mourning. Grand Admiral Skora, the hero who had led humanity to victory against the Andromedans, was dead, his life given in service to the cause of peace. But even as the tears of billions fell, a new threat emerged from the shadows. The Zeniths, the ancient race that had so recently saved humanity from the brink of annihilation, suddenly turned on the Galactic Council. Their ships, sleek and deadly, appeared above the Council's headquarters without warning, their weapons primed and ready. The Zenith leader, a being of impossible beauty and terrible power, broadcast a message to the stunned council members. You are not worthy, it said, its voice resonating through every speaker and translator. You are primitive, warlike, unfit to rule the stars. Only we, the Zeniths, have the wisdom and the right to guide the galaxy. With that, the Zeniths opened fire. Their weapons, advanced beyond anything the Council races had ever seen, tore through shields and armor like paper. The Council fleet, still battered and weakened from the war with the Andromedans, was caught completely off guard. Across the galaxy, Zenith forces struck at key targets, overwhelming defenses and subjugating entire worlds. Many of humanity's allies, their strength sapped by the previous conflict, fell quickly before the onslaught. Humanity fought back with everything they had. A new generation of leaders, forged in the crucible of the Andromedan War, rallied their forces and launched desperate counterattacks. But it wasn't enough. The Zenith's technology was too advanced, their ships too powerful. Every engagement ended in defeat for the human forces. 
In a secret facility deep beneath the surface of Earth, a team of scientists worked feverishly on a last desperate gamble. They had been tasked with developing a new weapon, a device that could turn the tide of the war. Now, as reports of Zenith victories poured in from across the galaxy, they knew they were out of time. The lead scientist, a haggard man named Dr. Elias Novak, stared at the schematics before him. The weapon was a doomsday device, capable of destroying entire star systems. It was a monstrous thing, a violation of every principle of ethics and morality. But with the fate of humanity, of the entire galaxy, hanging in the balance, what choice did they have? There was dissent among the human leadership. Some argued that using such a weapon was a line they could never come back from, that it went against everything humanity stood for. But others countered that the Zeniths had left them no choice. If they couldn't defeat the Zeniths militarily, they could at least make the cost of conquest too high. In the end, the decision was made. The order was given, the weapon was deployed. Across Zenith-occupied space, stars winked out of existence as the Doomsday device did its terrible work. Entire systems teeming with life were wiped out in an instant. Billions of Zeniths, along with countless subjugated races, were annihilated in the blink of an eye. The Zeniths, stunned by the scale of destruction, finally agreed to negotiate. A fragile peace was achieved, the Zeniths withdrawing from their conquered territories. But the cost had been incalculable. The galaxy lay in ruins, shattered and divided. Entire civilizations had been destroyed, and the death toll reached into the billions. Many races now looked upon humanity with fear and suspicion, seeing them as monsters willing to burn the galaxy to save themselves. As the dust settled, the human leadership grappled with the consequences of their actions. They had saved the galaxy from Zenith domination, but at what price? The ideals of cooperation and unity that Scora had fought for seemed like a distant dream, replaced by a new era of mistrust and uncertainty. The once great Galactic Council, the body that was meant to bring the races together, lay broken and powerless. It fell to humanity, the ones who had dealt the final blow, to try to pick up the pieces, but with their reputation in tatters and their allies turned against them, it was a task that seemed almost impossible. The future was uncertain, and dark clouds gathered on the horizon. Humanity had won its freedom, but in doing so, it may have lost its soul. The story ended on a somber note, with the question hanging in the air, could humanity rise from the ashes of this terrible war and rebuild what had been lost? Or would they and the entire galaxy be consumed by the very cycle of violence and destruction they had sought to break? You have reached the end of the story. If you enjoyed this story and want to support us, please leave a like and subscribe to our channel, and for every comment that says 88, I will heart every single one of them. Thank you for your time.